Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Good morning. Welcome to Smart Companies Radio. I'm Kelly Scanlon, publisher of Thinking Bigger Business Media. Joining us today is Homer Hickam. He is the author of 12 best-selling books, including the acclaimed memoir Rocket Boys, which was made into the film October Sky, and I'm sure that most of you have seen that book. And Rocket Boys is studied in hundreds of schools. It's popular around the world and uh, just to wide acclaim. Then after graduating from college as an engineer, Homer was a decorated combat officer in the 4th Infantry Division in Vietnam. For more than 30 years, Homer was a scuba instructor and an expert wreck diver. He was awarded Alabama's highest award for heroism for his underwater rescue work. He also trained astronauts and designed spacecraft for NASA. And he's an amateur paleontologist who has discovered not one, but two Tyrannosaurus rexes. But most of all, he loves to write, and he's won many awards for his books. He has millions of fans. His latest book is a Western mystery adventure titled The Dinosaur Hunter. Welcome to the show today, Homer. Well, Kelly, thank you for having me. Well, we're so glad to have you here. And as I said, you have millions of fans around the world. And and because of the October Sky movie, most people probably do know you best as the high school student who experimented with the rockets and and helped launch the U.S. space uh, program and and the man on the moon, the whole nine yards. But You know, know, one of my uh, sidelines is I go out and speak, um, uh, speaking engagements at universities and businesses and so on. And one of the first things I do, I look out in the audience and I see the young ladies out there, and I apologize for not actually being Jake Gyllenhaal. Uh, (laughs) You know, I I know they're looking at me and they're going, who is this old gray-haired dude and where is that boy in the movie? (laughs) Oh, well, that's pretty funny, but, you know... uh, one of the, in spite of all that, in spite of all of the popularity from the movie and so forth, I know that you've said that you knew from the time that you were in the third grade that you wanted to be a writer. And when people see what you did in the movie, see that part of your life story, and they hear about your writing, they may wonder how you can marry those two careers, you know, rocket scientist and fiction writer. And so how, how do you marry those? Are they ever at odds with each other or just... Well, no, not really. You know, I believe that if it had not been for the era of Sputnik where the Americans got in a big uh, space race with the Russians and I was uh, totally mesmerized by that, I would probably be- become an English professor at some university really? and I've been real happy uh, writing books. But I get so ama- enamored, along with millions of other young people, I might add, with the idea of going into space that I was willing, to, even though I was having trouble with um, math and uh, science at that time, mm-hmm. I got in, I got intrigued by it. I got interested in it, and I'm really glad that it worked out this way. I mean, I did end up uh, working for NASA for 18 years, and uh, but along the way with my engineering career, I got out. I met a lot of very interesting people I might not have met at that university. Wow. And in the process, all of that was uh, ultimately ended up being... Uh, you know, a good grist for my mill in terms of my writing. So all the mm-hmm. all the folks that I met as an engineer and across the country and the world, I spent uh, many months in Japan training the first uh, Japanese astronauts, for instance. All of that, ultimately, I was able to use for my writing. So I'm kind of glad it worked out uh, worked out that way. And when I was work for NASA, I'd get up every morning. I'd say, oh, boy, I get to go work for NASA today. I mean, how <laughs> cool is that? And, right. And now I get up and I get to write. So... I've been very blessed uh, throughout my life, and uh, and I'm very appreciative for all of it. Well, and and something that you said there strikes me as really being a, a similarity between what you did with NASA and what you are doing with your writing. You said that you were enamored with space exploration, and at that time to look out at the sky and to imagine what could be is not a whole lot different in some respects than when you sit down and you look at a piece of paper and you think, what could this become? <laughs> You're, you know, the, the imagination, the creative well, process. It, it very definitely under. does. The imagination uh, takes over. And I, I really think, you know, it, one of the reasons I also was interested was because of all the science fiction that I had read growing uh, growing up. And I think that, that you know, for young folks uh, these days, um uh, when they read science fiction and when they read some of my work as well, uh, the memoirs and such, uh, I hope that they get a sense that uh, that there's this this you know this huge place that 
that our minds can go before our bodies ever do. And if mm-hmm. we imagine that we can go into space and go to the moon and go on out, then we can do it. But you have to first be able to imagine it. And that's where the, the you combine literature and science, really. Um, most of the times it's it's the creative folks, the Arthur C. Clarke's, uh, and and uh, Robert Heinlein and Isaac Asimov who imagine what can be done and then the scientists and engineers come along and say, yep, um, let's try that. I bet we can do it. Absolutely. And it's not a whole lot different either than the business owners in our audience who have an idea for a business and, and then they have to, they imagine it and then they have to make it work. So so all kinds of similarities there. Well, now, there are, you know, as a writer, uh, there is a business in, in writing, and yes. uh, you have to learn how all that works in the, the marketplace, and, and you get out there. And, and, you know, I'm actually the publisher's nightmare because I end up <laughs> writing different genres. I, I, mm-hmm. I'm best known for memoirs, but I've written uh, a little science fiction. I have a new novel called Crater. It's set on the moon yes. 120 years from now, coming out in April. But uh, most publishers like their authors just to stick with one genre. But I switch around. And when I worked for NASA, um, I also I worked with spacecraft design for a while. And then I thought, boy, what would be really fun would be to train the astronauts. So I got involved with that as well. I think you have to, you have to stay fresh in whatever you're doing. You do have to be innovative as, as you do it. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about your new book coming up, Crater. Tell us what that's about. <laughs> well, um uh, my publisher has been after me to write another science fiction book for a long time. I wrote Back to the Moon um, way back in 1999. It did very, very well. So uh, I finally got beat up over the head enough to go out and try it again. And this time I decided to, to kind of combine a lot of the aspects of my other writing, including Rocket Boys, which is set in a small little uh, coal mining town, um, and Back to the Moon by setting it, uh, setting this story on the moon 120 years from now in a small mining town. They're mining Helium-3. This is the first of what we call the Helium-3 trilogy. Mm -hmm. And the main character is a young man, 16 years old, named Crater. And uh, Crater, uh, uh, he is an experienced Helium-3 miner. He's been working on the scrapes, as they call the mine, for three years. And uh, they have a great labor shortage on the moon, so as soon as uh, you want to work or whoever wants to come to work, they let them mm-hmm. work. It doesn't matter about your age or anything else. This is this is the raw frontier. Okay, and so has so, the moon been colonized at this point, or are they bringing people to the moon specifically for this mining expedition? It, there, it's uh, not been colonized by any countries or anything. Okay. It's the entrepreneurs who are getting okay. out there. Helium-3 uh, uh, actually is a, uh, a real isotope oh, that covers the moon. Uh, the Apollo astronauts brought it back on their rocks, and it turned out that helium-3 is the perfect fuel for fusion reactors. Now, fusion reaction ultimately is going to be the energy uh, resource for the world because it's clean um, and it produces huge amounts of energy. It's the same uh, concept as the sun, and uh, fusion reaction is. That's what that's how the sun works. And mm-hmm. so someday we will go to the moon and mine helium-3. Now, uh, who will do it? That's question and where I perceive 120 years from now it would be like the same uh, entrepreneurs who went out and started first started digging coal mines mm-hmm. uh, sure. it, it wasn't the government it was uh, it was men and women with the courage and uh, the uh, the entrepreneurship if you will to go out and 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 sink all their money into this idea so that's what I see happening 120 years from now little mining towns all over the moon independent and wanting to stay that way Let's talk about innovation in America right now. Obviously, when you were experimenting with your rockets in high school, space exploration was something that everybody was curious about. And in the early 60s with Kennedy uh, as president, he he said, we're going to go to the moon. And he got people excited about it, started putting a lot of emphasis on uh, math and science in the schools. And... Some people say we've gotten away from that. Where where do you see, or what do you see as the state of innovation in America today, and, and where do you see it going? Well, in terms of uh, the, the space race, it, it's very hard to recreate something like the space race all over again. That was we were involved in a in a very deadly cold war with the russians at that time we were afraid that they were going to blow us off the map and we, and they were afraid we were going to blow them off the map and when the russians got ahead of us in space by launching the world's earth satellite uh the united states uh just went a little crazy about the uh, 
about space, and we've got to catch up. And I'd like to say that the Russians launched Sputnik in 1957. The United States launched its students in 1958. Mm -hmm. We had a huge workload. All of a sudden, uh, academics became so much tougher. You couldn't buy an A back then. You just Mm -hmm. couldn't do it. Uh, But we had in place uh, the Verna Von Braun team uh, down in Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, the folks down in Houston came together. We had we had the perfect team to put together in terms of uh, all the innovations that was required to take us to the moon. Afterwards, after we went to the moon, got that uh, done, uh, the United States, we decided to pull back uh, for whatever reason, and uh, we flew the space shuttle you know, for 30 for 30 some years, right. and we got kind of used to that. We got a little bit complacent. Uh, we just flew the shuttle over and over and over again, and uh, we let uh, some of the uh, innovative ideas like nuclear propulsion and antimatter propulsion and all the things that I, I really wish we had been working on get away from us at that time. But now I see, you know, uh, um, with the shuttle being canceled and NASA kind of in turmoil, not quite knowing really what it wants to do, mm-hmm. I do see a great opportunity for the innovators in space travel. Okay. And you think that's going to give the uh, business community, the private business community, an opportunity then when, I, with the I, government? I really, really, I really do hope so. Now, getting into space is, is extremely expensive the way we do it right now. I'm a big fan of the little company called SpaceX. Uh, Elon Musk, who, who the PayPal billionaire, heads that up. Uh-huh. Um, I've met some of their uh, engineers. I'm very impressed by what they're doing there. And uh, they're actually they're going to be able to put very heavy payloads into a uh, low-Earth orbit cheaper than the Chinese can do it. And uh, if our government is smart, uh, they will keep the seed money coming towards SpaceX and some of the other uh, entrepreneurial uh, space companies. But those companies, of course, are using technology that uh, was perfected by NASA many, many years ago, I believe that it's the government's role uh, to uh, create, to go out and create new technologies and then let private enterprise take that and make something out of it. Mm-hmm. Now, you said, if I, if I heard you right, you said that your book, Crater, is set 120 years into the future? That's, that's right. Do you think it's going to take us 120 years to get to that point? <laughs> <laughs> well, or, or... I fear so. Um, at the rate that uh, that we're going right now, uh, we we don't really have a destination. Uh, I really do believe, in my opinion, that it should be for us to go back to the moon and actually uh, study how to use the lunar resources. There are a lot of re- resources uh, resources there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we ought to um, let private industry uh, uh, do that, but we should, as a government, as a people. We should be helping them uh, as as they need it, but ultimately, I think there are great profits to be made out there. But um, right now, I don't. Uh, it seems like that um, most of the uh, energy has kind of uh, waned in terms of uh, government uh, government space activities. Uh, of course, we're in the middle of this uh, really tough, rough uh, recession. Right. Uh, but I really think, you know, if there's a place where you actually wanted to spend stimulus money, space would be the perfect place because all kinds of studies have shown that 10 to $12 come back for every dollar that you spend on it mm-hmm. because you're essentially uh, funding new technology. If you just build yeah. the same stuff over and over again, that's not very helpful. But if you fund new technology, come up with new products, and then let the American entre- entrepreneurs take it, and take it out to market, then that's that's a good combination of government and uh, and and uh, small private businesses that then become big private businesses, which uh, you know that's that's the heart of America. Yeah, and you hit the nail on the head right there because when you're talking about the return on investment, the you know ten to one on the dollar, whatever it was that you said, um, it's it's not just about going into space. It's a, what all the different things that need to be created in order to get you into space have commercial applications back home as well, and it the the monetization of that feeds back into the economy and there's more innovation. It's just it just feeds on each other. Well, so. it really, really does, and it, I think it's one of the things that's that's misunderstood about um, federal government uh, or all government spending money on technologies, whether it's for for space or for energy or whatever it is. Um, essentially, um, that's cr- uh, creating uh, some new technology that at first you may not know what it is and mm-hmm. how it's to be used, but entrepreneurs will figure it out, and uh, so that's that's just money uh, well spent that uh, 
that does open up new markets for the country. And there's never been a dollar spent in space unless they play a poker game up on the international <laughs> space station. Uh, you know, it doesn't go. Good point. They don't haul the money up there. It's all spent right here on Earth, and uh, and uh, engineers and scientists uh, are are paid for 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 their work, and they they typically do not get involved. With uh, with things that that really don't matter, they're they're doing stuff. They're doing important work, and again, that work spins off uh, into the private industry. And the next thing, it's really about the best way for the United States to to stay ahead of the world. We're probably ever not ever going to be able to compete uh, uh, with their labor wages. I hope we never try. Mm-hmm. We don't want to get down to that uh, that low an income for our folks. What we have to do is stay ahead in terms of science and technology so that we are creating the new products and uh, we get paid for that and then the rest of the world catches up, but we have to kind of speed ahead. If we if we fall behind technologically, then uh, as a society, uh, we're in really big trouble. Well, you know, you said a minute ago, uh, you, you referenced the recession, and I'm curious, uh, when you were trying to do your experiments, at least according to the movie, uh, when you were trying to do your experiments, you had to uh, scrap for different things. You had to be resourceful in order to get the tools and the materials. You had to talk people into helping you covertly yeah, we to were a pretty, certain extent. We were pretty pitiful, and um, the uh, we had a lot of folks that helped us. Uh, the machinists would uh, sneak around and do uh, work on our rockets. So, I mean, building those rockets required, uh, they were much more advanced than they showed in the movie, and they required a working knowledge of calculus and differential equations. So I was having trouble with algebra at the right. time. And also um, a very uh, highly skilled machine work that had to be done. And so we had to uh, rely on folks who, who wanted to help these kids, these crazy kids who were doing mm-hmm. something pretty pretty special. Right. So so with all that resourcefulness, I mean, you found a way to get it done, though. And that that's the important part. You found a way, in spite of the obstacles, in spite of the shortages, you found a way to get it done. What would you say in this in this economy that we're in, where resources can be a bit lacking for entrepreneurs at times, and, and they are limited with their funding and so forth, what kind of advice would you give to some of these innovators who are having trouble getting getting their ideas out, you know, put to, to work? Uh, what would you say to them? Well, you know, first, the, the most important thing is passion. You've got to have a passion for your product, passion for whatever you're doing. Uh, without that passion, um, then, then it, it's, it's difficult in any market. But I believe that right now is as good as any time to start a small business or, uh, or, or, or come up with a, a, a commercial working plan if it's something you're truly, truly passionate about. I don't care if it's uh, what it is, whether it, even if it's skateboarding, if if your passion is skateboarding, well, get out there and figure out how to build a better skateboard or or uh, work in the industry. There there is a lot of ways to approach that, but you got to have passion before you do anything, and then you have to get a plan. I mean, you have to have a true hard-headed business plan, and so go out and talk to entrepreneurs who have already been successful, ask them questions. I mean, uh, I think uh, most folks in in um, Small business and who are entrepreneurs like to hear from young people. They like to be asked questions. They're probably ignored for the most part by young people. They need to be asking them, uh, "How you know? I've got this idea for a business. How do you think I should proceed?" And then, and once you've got a, a, a passion for something, uh, and then you've got a plan, then it's only a matter of perseverance. I like to call that the three P's of success: passion, planning, and perseverance. But you got to realize. That perseverance is really, really uh, very, as important as the first two because there will be setbacks. There will be times when you think, "Oh no, um, I, 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 this is just not going to work." And, and um, uh, but you got to give it that one more day, and you got to keep trying. And eventually, I'm just absolutely convinced in this in- economic environment, any economic environment, um, the man or the woman who has this idea and a passion to make it happen and has a great uh, business plan. Uh, and the perseverance to follow through can make it happen. Well, and that's so true. There's a quote that I like. I, I don't know the, um, who to attribute it to exactly, but but it's uh, about the time that you think you're going to give up, remember why you started in the first place. Exactly. And and I think that's just such a good quote for entrepreneurs to hang their hats on. Uh, to keep- and uh, thank goodness I had uh, interesting parents. They never agreed on anything, and uh, they gave me a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, good things to write about, <laughs> or bad things, if you will, uh, in, in, in my books, and also the people there, and the teachers especially, the teachers yeah. um, who were a very, very special uh, group of men and women who 
really passed along to us the knowledge and the techniques that we needed to uh, to succeed throughout our life. And over 80% of the kids I went to school with in Colwood went to and graduated from college. So wow, that's, that's remarkable. Yeah. That really is. And, you know, you talked about those teachers, and you were talking a little bit earlier about business owners, you know, new business owners or, or prospective business owners tapping into the entrepreneurs who are already out there and have have been successful and it, it's just the importance of mentorship whether it's your teacher whether it's another entrepreneur who's who's already walked the path that you hope to walk um talk to us a little bit about the mentors in your life and and how they've contributed to your success why it's so important well i mean certainly uh my mom was a was a great mentor and uh she she um uh, she constantly pushed me uh, to succeed. Um, she wanted me out of that town, the little town mm-hmm. of Colwood. She wanted me out into the great world and whatever it was, mm-hmm. whatever I was passionate in. I mean, she was. She would. Uh, I mean, she would actually uh, harass me to make me <laughs> make me fall <follow> through. <laughs> with Sometimes I was a pretty uh, uh, poor student and kind of lazy, and she would beat me over the head till I got going again. And after a while, I learned. Well, I don't want to be beat over the head. I better get going. <laughs> uh, the teachers, um, of course, I write about. Uh, with great affection and love uh, our Miss Riley, who was a young woman who uh, taught us uh, physics and chemistry over at uh, the high school, Big Creek High School. And ultimately, um, she backed us up uh, in everything that we did, uh, took our side when it was not good for her career to do so, took our side and... uh, and taught us. She she got us the book that we needed. It was called Principles of Guided Missile Design, and um, it, I later saw it in a PhD program for rocket wow. science. And um, it, it it we had to to learn a lot very rapidly in order to understand that book. But and I thanked her profuse, profusely for it because it came out of her own pocket. It wasn't inexpensive. And she said, all I did was give you a book. You have to have the courage to learn what what's inside it. And I think that that's true of a lot of books and a lot of things that uh, throughout life, uh, it can be handed to you. But unless you have the courage to take it and do something with it, then it's then it's it's not worth anything. And I think that's true for living in this country. Uh, we have handed to us great opportunities, and if we don't take advantage of them, then they're not worth much. Uh, so we have to first we have to understand what those opportunities are. And, and again, that gets back to Letting people know what your dream is. If you have a passion for something, whatever it is, don't keep it to yourself. Tell someone you respect. Tell your parents. Tell your teachers. Tell a business person. Tell somebody that 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 you respect what your dream is, what your passion is. And I believe that in this country especially that people will stand up and, and say, I'll help you do that if that's what you want to do. Because we get so much these days, I think, for young people just keep quiet about what they really want to do, they're afraid that somebody's going to make fun of them uh, mm-hmm. or bully them in some way. They've got to stand up. Uh, some high schools use Rocket Boys in their curriculum uh, because, I, of I, bullying, yeah. because of bullying. Because uh, of bullying, you have the really the smart kids. The, the, they call them nerds, and they you know knock their glasses off and all right. that kind of dumb right. stuff that goes on in high school. Uh, Rocket Boys shows where these kids they didn't care. They had this passion to do something. They didn't care that all that high school uh, wanted to do was uh, was uh, talk about the football team and the cheerleaders and all that. Mm-hmm. They didn't care. They had a passion. They had a dream, and they made it come true because they had uh, they they let people know what their passion was, and they were willing to fight for it. And they had uh, teachers and parents and so on that were also willing to stand beside them. Right. You know, it's really remarkable when you reflect back on it. I'm sure to think that this this dream that you had of sending these rockets up into the sky resulted not only in um, you know the most massive the beginning of the most massive space exploration that we'd undertaken but then all of the you know the book that you wrote and all the adaptations of it like you say it's being used in some school curriculum now uh you have this uh October Sky Festival that is helping your hometown and, and helping uh, the people there and the, the kids there. And then you also have, uh, if I understand it right, you have the uh, musical, the Rocket Boys, the musical. Tell us about that. Well, that's true. I, you know, I had a lot of playwrights come uh, at me after Rocket Boys was a big success, and they wanted to make a stage play on it. And I said, no, I didn't want anybody tampering with my work. If anybody mm-hmm. was going to write a stage play, I would write the stage play. <laughs> um, but... Um, 
they had a very talented uh, young group uh, from uh, New York uh, come in and uh, proposed a musical, and they sent along actually a CD with music in it. I uh, and I didn't think much of it, but I one day I, I put it in the player and played their music, and it was it just absolutely blew me away. It was so good. And um, so I got in touch with them, and I said, I will help you. We'll, I'll help you write the stage play and uh, keep writing that great music. And uh, it's um, we had a, uh, a run at Theater West Virginia, which is a professional group, uh, uh, this summer. And it was um, sold out almost every night, standing uh, ovations at the end of it. We plan on uh, taking this uh, now out into the country. Uh, we'll probably go to San Diego and L.A. and mm-hmm. Kansas City. Oh, and, well, uh, be eager to see it if you get it here. Well, absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, these uh, uh, the, the writers and the composers uh, did something at the Gladstone uh, Amphitheater uh, this past summer oh. uh, called Flyer. And uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, we'd love to come to Kansas City. We'd love to go to Chicago. But ultimately, ultimately we are headed for Broadway. And, and you know, folks want to... Hear the music and uh, learn a little, little bit more about it. They can go out to uh, RocketBoysTheMusical.com dot com and uh, listen to some of that great music. My job as a uh, playwright in this case is basically to get out of the way of the music because that's why mm-hmm. you go to the musical to, right. to hear and uh, and also to hear the music and also see the great dancing and and so on. So it's a lot of fun. Why do you think that after all these decades? And it has been decades now. Uh, audiences are still so fascinated by your story. You know, I think it, there there are a lot of threads that run in this story, and it kind of depends on the on on the person. I know that there are a lot of uh, men out there who are really taken by the father son story. That's a very strong thread that runs mm-hmm. throughout this, and the fact that the father doesn't approve of the, of the son. There's tension between the father and the son. Um, and uh, I think uh, a lot of men especially get that, although some women uh, do too. They had really tough fathers who didn't pay enough attention to them, so they really do get that. I think the family dynamics, when I go out and speak and I say, okay, uh, let's have a question and answer, invariably people want to know, uh, you know, uh, uh, how's your brother doing? Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what happened to your mom? And what happened to your dad? And what happened to these other characters in there? So they're very interested in the people that are in the story. And of course, then at another level, there are the there's the idea of these young kids building these uh, really um, uh, high performance rockets in the coal fields, and then mm-hmm. it's quite a quite a dichotomy between the two there. So, I, you know, you kind of blend it all together, and for some reason, and I've never totally figured out, I think the author is the last one to know, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, for some reason, this story just grabbed people from the very first, when I first started telling it, even before I'd written a book, people were just fascinated uh, by it, and um, I'm, I'm certainly glad. I had a lot of uh, men and women come up and say, you know what? The the story of the Rocket Boys, that's sort of my story, too, and I had similar experiences, and I always say, well, I'm sure I'm glad I beat you to it. <laughs> but, yeah, you can't tell me they built rockets like you guys did. That was, that was amazing. I, I think that, you know, you mentioned the two different levels, but just that 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 overcoming the odds and, and chasing your dream, I just... You know, those those are always such great stories, and and when you talk about overcoming the odds and chasing your dreams, and then what that turned into historically for our country. Um, that's it's just a fascinating story. Yeah, I'm always uh, I'm always you know pleased and a little bit surprised that people uh, take the story as inspirational, but certainly millions do. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm glad for that. But I'm glad I didn't sit down to write an inspirational story. If I had, then it probably wouldn't have been very inspirational. I, I sat down and wrote the story. I let it unfold uh, the way it happened. Uh, and hopefully I wrote it in an interesting way. And um, it, it, But people take inspiration from what happened to us, and uh, I, I'm certainly glad of that. And it's, it's you know, around the world. I was, uh, I'm was i a Vietnam veteran. I was over right. in Vietnam uh, last year where Rocket Boys, of all things, came out in Vietnamese. And um, the, the the kids there were just totally enamored by this. I mean, it's completely alien territory for them, uh, a coal town in West Virginia. But right. they loved the story, and they took inspiration from it, too. Yeah. Well, and you have certainly led a very remarkable life. I mean, for heaven's sakes, a paleontologist. Uh, <laughs> you're also, a, just, just real quickly, tell us about what drives your interest there. 
Well, um, that actually came from October Sky also. Joe Johnston, uh, the director of October Sky, also directed a little movie called Jurassic Park 3. Mm -hmm. And I went out with him when I was doing some research in Montana and fell in love with Montana and fell in love with with, uh, hunting dinosaurs. And so, uh, you know, I'm a West Virginia boy. I can tell one rock from the other. And it didn't take me too long before I'd uh, I'd got my own little team together and under uh, the Museum of the Rockies, uh, permit, uh, we we started to to, find, to make some great finds out there in Montana, and and uh, and you know it's all grist from my writing mill. Um, uh, after uh, doing about a decade's worth of work there, I realized, well, hey, you know, I should write a novel about this, and that's where mm-hmm. the Dinosaur Hunter, uh, my most recent novel, came out last year, uh, came from out out of not only. Uh, my love of paleontology and hunting dinosaurs, but also the people who live out there in those badlands of Montana. Yeah, well, it sounds like one of the underlying themes throughout all of your career and your experience has been exploration, though, whether it's space, whether it's uh, uh, words on a page and what they will become, uh, or, you know, exploring and and discovering, (laughs) too. Well, you know, again, I I, I owe everything to the people at Colwood, the way they raised me. Um, You know, they they are proud of who they are, and they stand up for what they believe. They keep their families together, and they trust in God but rely on themselves. And that was the the principles that they taught me, and I've kind of lived by them as best I can. I, you know, I never could quite come up to to their level, but um, I've certainly tried to throughout my life to make them proud of me. And uh, I think that's uh, that is one of the reasons why we have had some very successful kids come out of those coal fields in West Virginia is mm-hmm. because we want to make the people back home proud of us, and we work hard to make that happen. And if anybody is interested in finding out more about all the different things that you do, where can they uh, find more information? Well, they can certainly go to my website, homerhickam.com. Everything is kind of there. Uh, Hickam is spelled H-I-C-K-A-M, homerhickam.com. And from there, um, all the links that will take you out to the musical and to the other books and so on are all there. Well, it's certainly a remarkable career, as I said. Thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time today, sharing your thoughts. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather.